You're ready to roll. You've got your space background. You're in. You want me, you want me to take it away? No, it looks cool. Yeah. Yeah. You're recording the video. Power, too it would actually allow it, but my uh, so MacBook is one of the little thin ones that I got. I don't, it's maybe two years old, three years old, but it doesn't have enough computing power to allow for uh, my background to change. So. Yeah, you'll come to it. I've got to accept the wall. <laughs> <laughs> That works fine. I've been considering in some of the other ones I've done, I have a big poster. I was going to put that up. So I was considering actually just getting a white background. Uh, mm. I think what I wanted to do, and, and I'm sure as a sports fan, you'll, you can uh, accept this, but you know, when they uh, do interviews of uh, uh, for FIFA or for any of the soccer professionals, they have that box that they sit in mm -hmm. like a box. And then they have the little logos all over it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get one of those made and stick that in behind me. So it just looks like we're being interviewed all the time with uh, on uh, FIFA sports. I haven't got around to making it yet, but I did get a picture taken in front of one when I was in, uh, uh, where was it? I went to the Arsenal stadium. I don't know if you've been to the Arsenal stadium. No. It's pretty sick. So I went to the Arsenal stadium two years ago and I did a tour of it. Uh, I didn't get to watch a game there because uh, the the ticket selling and all that is very weird in England when you're uh, when you own the tickets and you try to resell them they get mad at the um, owners that it's illegal to do it so um, I ended up not going to an Arsenal game because the tickets were I don't even know 250 250 euros a ticket and uh, <clears throat> I couldn't get tickets so. I decided to uh, go to a Chelsea game instead. It was when Chelsea was really sucking. So uh, they were, uh, local fans were giving their tickets away per se. No way. Well, they weren't giving them away. I had to pay 200 euros for a ticket, but mm -hmm. I ended up buying like uh, the two of us, three, three of us went. So it was pretty good. It was good, a great game, great match, but uh, Chelsea fans were just totally bored out of their mind because they weren't having a great year. Um, I didn't get to see Arsenal play, but regardless, I did want that background because it was just pretty cool. So, yeah, I think uh, you make me thinking that maybe I should put one in my spaceship as well. <laughs> I think you should. Uh, I also went to, and I don't know if uh, relevant or not, but I did go to uh, a PSG game uh, oh, wow. two years ago. And I will say, I don't know if you've been to the stadium for. Yeah, I have. I have. Years. I have. Yeah, I have. Okay, that's good. Because then I was going to hang up and be like, I don't think this interview is going to work. You haven't been to a PSG game. <laughs> yeah, well, you'd be, you'd be surprised. But most time um, I went into stadiums, it was to see pretty much everything but a, uh, a football game. Oh, really? So, yeah, so I was um, um, following the, um, you know, the motocross uh, X game. Yep. Yeah, so I went to see the... Um, the X Games, um, and uh, yeah, so I, I like so I'm a I'm a uh, an engine a sport, you know, engine guy. You know, I like when uh, there is a bit of science and engineering. Yep. You know, um, working with humans, that's what excites me. Formula oh. One, MotoGP, and motocross. Yeah. Not that I know who are the top, you know, best. I mean, I would I could get, I could name a few names, but. I'm not a huge fan to the point where I follow, but that's what I enjoy watching. Oh, for sure. I yeah, race myself. Cool. So we've had a few. I've been to a few of them in, in uh, Toronto at the uh, um, was it ACC and Skydome. So yeah, there's, uh, yeah. there's a few that are pretty cool. But I did watch PSG play, and I'll say that of all the stadiums that I have been in, they <laughs> it was one of the older ones, like the older style, and. Uh, but they had the most intense fans. Like French people are already intense, but <laughs> add that to football, and it just tops the game, man. Because they have those big drop-offs, like you know the trench. Yeah. So if you decide to rush the field after you yep. climb the four <laughs> rope fence, fall down, get to the bottom, then you got to go into a twenty-foot trench, <laughs> and then still feed off the, the cops that are all standing around the outskirts of it, and make sure you take them out before you can even get to the field. So wait, can you wait a taza? An hour and a half. 
<laughs> but yeah. yeah, it's pretty cool though. Like the they had this um, uh, stomping thing where the each side of the cr- crowd would stomp on each end. Yeah, so supporter section on both sides. So the one side would stomp up and down, chanting, and then mm-hmm. they stop, and then they would turn and throw it to the other side, and then the other side would start going. It was just <laughs> amazing. Like it was probably honestly it was the best game, sports match I've seen where the crowd was so into the game. Outside of uh, uh, Bersheva in Israel, yeah, uh, they didn't start the match there for 15 minutes after the game already started because they let off so many smoke bombs in the stadium that you couldn't see the field and you couldn't see the ground. So we had to wait until the air blew the smoke out before the game started. So they dropped the ball, they dropped the blue whistle, they started the game, the t- clock was going, but you couldn't see anything. So we actually all stood there and so waited. So players were still playing, but the you couldn't just stood the there. Everybody just stood there like this. And then the, then the smoke tried to got up and then someone decided they kicked the ball and keep going. That's how crazy that was. One, once, that yeah. Paris once if, yeah. Once everybody swallowed the uh, the smoke, then uh, then you could <laughs> exactly. see the game. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Everybody's got cancer in the end of the game, yeah. but at least you saw the game. <laughs> yeah. It was pretty cool, though. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, you know what? We're already into this. So welcome yeah. everybody to uh, OPN's Ask an Angel. Today we're with Kevin. Kevin's awesome, as you can already tell. We're having a great discussion about everything. Uh, Kevin. Uh, comes across as being a British UK guy, except for he's a French guy who's landed in the British UK side and he's kicking ass a butt over there. And uh, he's got a really <laughs> cool model and lots of great things going on. But Kevin, I'm going to turn it over to you. Maybe give us a quick introduction on your background, on yourself and what you guys are up to. And then one thing about you that nobody would know. Right. So um, let's start with the thing that uh, everybody would know um, after a few words. I'm uh, French, grew up in um, North, um, kind of out the outskirts of Paris. Um, first job was firefighter, then went to uh, went on to many other things, um, such as uh, photography, uh, logistic, uh, transport, and um, kind of ha- were having my first 20 years in France. But um, when I looked at the clock and uh, I looked at what I wanted to do with my life, I knew I didn't want to stay in France because I was trying to do something else. Uh, I didn't really know what that was. And I was super lucky because um, uh, one of my best friends, who was uh, much older than me and still is, um, was married with an amazing woman um, from Indianapolis in the U.S., I was um, telling her was like, well, I'm looking at doing something else and I want to, you know, I want to see what the U.S. is like. And then she says, well, why don't you go and, uh, you know, stay sometime in Indianapolis, you know, have, you know, my family and my friends, you know, taking care of you. You go there. I did not speak English. I was uh, I was just, uh, you know, barely speaking French, I suppose. Anyway, so I landed I landed in London and uh, in Indianapolis in uh, 2010 and uh, started to work for Remax in the US, so in, um, in uh, real estate. And did this for um, a few months, started to uh, kind of pick up, you know, the, the keywords to uh, sell houses and, and some stuff. But it was very much kind of um, mind opening because the US mentality for me was completely different than the work environment I was used to. So I literally kind of, um, I, came, I came completely changed uh, when I was back to France, and I I, did, I I knew I didn't want to stay there still, so um, I went to Australia, uh, applied to business school, went to Australia, and uh, uh, again that was a bit far away from uh, from um, the family and stuff, but it was amazing experience where working with, uh, well studying alongside amazing students from all over the world. Uh, and you get addicted to it. You get addicted by being surrounded by people who come from all b- diversity backgrounds, all sort of cl- um, classes, and y- you know you, you just get you know so addicted to it. So um, in 2014, I landed in London. Uh, it was for me two hours uh, from um, where my family was, and um, I'm studying I'm studying economics. 
and uh, after two months um, studying, one of my lecturer comes and one of my lecturer comes and says, "Well, I'm starting a business right now. We are, you know, a media company working in in the financial services industry. Do you want to come and do it with me?" So um, I started kind of um, taking off a um, a small startup, um, basically taking the business off the ground. To, trying to raise a bit of money, building the network, doing some business development, marketing, kind of touching everything when you are doing a, a small startup. And I ended up building a great network of active allocators. So typically family offices, hedge fund managers, emerging hedge fund managers, and so on. So I, I ended up building this network, which was um, kind of almost like a gift for me because I knew nobody in London when I landed in 2014. I didn't hear because I was following my, you know, a love or I, was, I didn't come here because I, you know, I didn't, I did not know what to do. I just came here and uh, I was just building this amazing network between Monaco and, um, and London. And, uh, you know, so lucky as, um, as is always, you know, the case when, uh, you know, in your career, luck is always, you know, a big part of your success. I met a guy who says, look, I'm taking over the uh, CEO of Microsoft Ventures role. And, uh, and I'm like, oh, wow, that sounds like an amazing, you know, uh, place to, um, you know, to be. Especially when you are in 2015, when there are not a lot of incubators and accelerators. I mean, they're just starting. I mean, it, it becomes to flourish like mushrooms. It becomes to start like mushroom, but it's still the very beginning. And there were not a lot of corporate venture um, arms and a lot of uh, corporate uh, accelerators as well. So then he, t he grabs me and say, look, I'm looking for somebody who wants to come and build a network, uh, build the brand, build a network and support the portfolio companies for Microsoft. And that's how I ended up in Microsoft at the end of 2015. Uh, super lucky, um, backed by an amazing man who just believed that I could do the job really. So um, I built a network for Microsoft for, for, for four years at the back of this. So I worked pretty much with um, 200 companies uh, for five years. Um, get to work alongside the leading VCs and uh, get to understand a bit more about how that world works because I'm new to it, right? I mean, 2015, 2016, I've never raised money from VCs before. You know, I barely understand how that works. And for four years, I had, you know, the chance to put a microscope on how VC works, how they create their deal flow, how they do, the, how they do their due diligence, um, how, how, what makes them choose a company. And I learned this for four years intensively. I just do crazy hours and, you know, and, you know, and working during the weekends and meet everybody I can, because for me, this is kind of a massive extension, to, you know, of my, of my business degree. If you like, I'm learning so much from some of the best, um, Android investors and VCs. And then um, I enjoy it. You know, I create the ecosystem. I bring people together. I connect the dots. That that's what I do. Um, and then um, all of a sudden, one of the research I'm involved um, at one of the research piece I'm involved at Microsoft kind of led me to work with um, London School of Economics, uh, the Open University, and Nesta uh, Innovation here in the UK. And the, the goal of that research was to study the impact of incubators and accelerators, which is, again, it was for me uh, an amazing opportunity to learn the limitations of incubators and accelerators because there are so much of them, right? There is about, back then, there was 125 incubators in, in, um, in the UK and about 250 accelerators. Um, and uh, so I get to study how they all work and how, you know, what's their own limitations, what the different business models that goes with such models and whether they make money or not, right? And whether they are aligned with the, uh, with the success of their portfolio companies and how they start to make money. And all of a sudden for me, then this picture became complete. I knew precisely how a company would raise their first 50K check and what kind, what kind of terms they we should go, um, they should go for, and uh, where to find that money, and what kind of investor you don't want to take the money from, 
right up to kind of you know working with companies that close 110 120 million from large us investors doing you know uh series b rounds so so i've covered all of this um and um you know spent a lot of time into the details of that and also looked at how those companies were emerging and supported by the economy by the ecosystem as a whole and that's how we came up um with uh, my co-founders but about creating a private startup ecosystem a private um market network as, as we call them which is concealance ventures Amazing. So you were also the youngest firefighter as well, were you not? <laughs> yeah, I was one of the, uh, certainly one of the uh, youngest of uh, my region and uh, certainly one of the youngest, of, you know, in France. Yeah. I like it. So you challenge everything. That's, that's the best way to go about it. So in the, in all this experience you had, including Microsoft, it sounds like you really started to build a flavor for early stage investing and how it works. Is that fair to say? Yeah, which is an amazing space to be right now. It is, and it seems like every day there's something new popping up and uh, everybody's going after this space like never before, uh, which is pretty amazing. Um, and I think there's gonna be a lot of uh, consolidation and weed out over the next two years because as everybody moves into a space and realizes that how tough it is, that um, things will start to kind of feather their way into other areas, right? Just like uh, the marijuana space went really quickly and then dissipated down. And now like every sector starts to get a lot of attention and, and then it spreads out when it realizes that it, it's tough. This isn't an easy space. So is there, there was one line that you guys mentioned that, and I think it, it really defines kind of where you guys are now. Um, and it was said, cash is king. And uh, maybe you can define a little bit more on what you mean by that in the world of a startup. Yeah, uh, I can't remember exactly where you saw this. We certainly think that cash is not the king. Uh, we really think that actually talent is uh, scarce uh, and uh, cash is abundant, right? We're not going to go down to what's going on right now with the rescue plans of various governments around the world, right? We're not going to be talking about quantitative easing, but in reality right now, when you look at, um, uh, let's look at macro first, right? Um, governments right now know that the only way to grow their GDP is by investing in entrepreneurship and innovation. Right, because that's the real economic tissue. Right, it's ninety-five percent, ninety-seven percent of the economy is small and medium businesses. Right now, because of the advent of internet and you know and other companies, other technologies that are built on the internet, then it becomes so easy to create new companies. Um, so software, you know, the cost of software, you know, has gone down uh, dramatically, right? It costs nothing to create software anymore. The hosting costs nothing. I mean, all of this becomes super cheap, right? Um, so it's actually not very complicated to put some sort of an MVP together and then pitch it to a VC, you pitch it to an early stage, you know, uh, investor such as an angel. So, and if you have something coherent and, and if you obviously get some, some buy-in from those people, you, they will write you a check. But the problem is, it's how you go from that to something that is a real business that will succeed. So you can get your first 150K or 250K check, but if you don't get surrounded by the right people very early in the process, no matter, no matter how much cash you have, you know, you're just going to be wasting the money, right? And the problem is that I think a lot more than before, as much as entrepreneur becomes democratized, the competition is also much more fierce. It's a lot harder to win because there's so many people coming up with ideas and so many, so much capital floating around. So the process of becoming an entrepreneur, it's a lot easier but the process of winning in this market, it's a lot harder, right? Because yep. there's so much money going to your competition and then the market moves so fast that if you don't spend the money rightly with the right person after the right market, then 
you're not you're not going to last right and you're not going to be the last right you know people talk about being the first at the end what matters is being the last in the market whether you start the first or you start the second or the fifth or the tenth who cares the point is do you really or, you know, build something which makes you last. Are you the last one, you know, in the monopoly, right? When there are only three players, because there is the rule of three, right? There is, you know, there are always three, you know, uh, global players, right? You've got, uh, you know, uh, you've got, it's the case for the train companies, it's the case for the telco, it's the case for the banks. It's, you know, in all of those countries, you always have, you know, three rulers, right? And all of the rest is obviously gone. So, you know, finding the money from angel investors, it's obviously good because it gets you going. But the reality is that this is not a game of money anymore. This is a game of being with the right people at the right time, using the, having the right discipline to do some trial and error, learn quickly, fail fast, restart again, doing, do it again and win, you know. So, um, and if you don't bring the right people around you, you're not going to be able to succeed. No, and I love that. And I, I think you, when we were touching on cash is king, I think it kind of referenced the fact that cash is abundant out there and you got to figure out a way to maneuver and work your way through everything to get to that win. And you defined it quite well that you're not going to get there if you don't have the right team. And a, and a great... Um, line that came, it was an interview I did a couple weeks ago, and um, the gentleman said, I would invest in a B product with an A company, mm -hmm. uh, or, or an A team. And uh, it, it's so true, because that A team will make that B product an A product. But mm -hmm. if you have a B team and an A product, yep. you don't have the same success, and it's not going to be able to turn itself the same way that you hope it will. So our uh, team is a, is a big proponent to, to growth and to figuring out where you need to be in a market. Yeah, well, I guess um, the nuance is that it's not all about the team. The team and has a network. And this, this is the, that layer that's, the, you know, the team is the first layer of the onion. But the network of that team, you know, the second, third layer of that onion is as important because it accelerates your sales cycle, it accelerates your credibility, it makes you avoid some mistakes that they've made before. You know, when we, when we, when we, you know, in our network, when we talk to somebody who's done that for 40 years, he's got the answers to the questions that you didn't, uh, you didn't even ask yourself. That's, that's power, you know, of leveraging somebody who's done it for 40 years who's seen all of the technology stacks evolving and who understands exactly. How, and because the things are always the same in the end, you know, they are always the same. So once they have developed this pattern to think, cre you know, think about something they've, they've seen in the past, they will tell you, I'm not sure I'm right. And that's usually how you see how smart they are. They tell you with humility, look, I've done this for 40 years. I've seen this working, but I'm not certain that that's the right answer, you know, and that is super, super powerful as opposed to somebody who's out of university with a nice degree from one of the leading university, right? And who's going to tell you, oh, yes, I've got my MBA. I'm 25, 30 years old and I've got the answers to everything. Well, you're gonna you're gonna have some bruises and some scarces, and uh, that's just the way it is. And you've got to learn. Agreed. So to follow on that, you made a you made a comment which I can tell you that in all the interviews I've done, I haven't heard this comment yet, which is crazy because in the workspace that we're in, it tends to happen quite often that you hear this. But you said fail fast. So. Your, your whole thing was trial and error and then fail fast. Can you give us an idea for the audience on what you mean by fail fast? Because I think people tend to think it means I'm working on something, it's not working, shut it down and start something new. And I'm not sure that that's the terminology we're going for, but mm. maybe you can explore that a little bit more. Yeah, so entrepreneurship and innovation is an iterative process, right? You never get it right. You never get it right. 
you know, there's, uh, unless, you know, unless you are super lucky, you are one of the very few, but, you know, the pattern is that you're not going to get it right. That's the foundation of innovation. The risk that you are taking is obviously unknown and your job as an entrepreneur is to try to reduce that risk. You know, so all we do as entrepreneurs is, and as investors is we look at opportunities. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know whether this is right or wrong. We see behaviors. We do our study. We understand market dynamics. We understand micro and macro trends. That's what we look at. And those things, um, and, but there, um, you know, if you do a triangle, there, you know, there's what you control. And on the top of that, there is what you don't have any control of, you know? So we focus a lot more on, you know, what we don't, what, what we control, because if you can if you control it, if you, if you really focus on what you control, then you're much, you're much more inclined to succeed, you know, with the things that you don't control. Yeah. So, you know, um, fail fast here means how quickly can you learn that's pretty much what it is how quickly can you learn if you're really learning something which is wrong about what you're doing what it is that you are what what are your actions that you um, you know must take in, in order to make a decision and you know if you are trying to sell stuff um, and um, then you don't really see people buying, then you probably are not something, you know, you're probably not in the right business, you know. So fail fast here means, and that's very much one of the big challenge that, you know, entrepreneurs are facing. It's because it's a lot easier today to find money from angel investors and early investors than from customers. Yeah, a lot easier super easy in fact you know especially when you are here in the uk when you have massive uh, you know uh you know a, ta a massive tax incentive where you know you know the investor in the end the the seis and eis investor is only taking 30 percent of the risk you know bottom line is 30 percent of the risk you know you invest 100k worse you lose you know it's not even 30k I but if you so, so that's, you know, and that's against, you know, it's great because it helps people to, it helps, you know, people to get going and it creates jobs. But yeah. the problem is that all of the sudden startups then become almost like, um, um, you know, lifestyle because it's so easy to put up, a, you know, a, a slide deck together and then kind of do a nice hockey stick curve saying this is our business model. But, you know, the reality is much harder. So, um so that's what we're saying. Fail fast is like validate that you have buyers as soon as you can. And so long as they have not put some money and then they're not supporting you and they don't need to be 1000 people, right? You know, you can find 10 people who give you, who write a small, you know, uh, check for buying the product, you know, that's pretty much what, and if you don't fail, if you don't find this, you know, if you don't find this small group of lovers, early, early adopters, then what it is that you should do in order to you know in order to do that and if you are in the right in the wrong direction just just you know fail give your money back to your investors there is no arm of being wrong because they are aware they are aware that this is risky they are aware that this is that you not you don't know what you're doing you think you do and you have to be a bit you need you need to you need to be a bit convinced about what you what you are after but in the end, if you really don't see the early, early signs of success, just give your money to you. Just give your money back to your investors, you know. And I'm don't believe that anybody sure. giving money back. But um, in in uh, I think overall it does sound good. But you're right. It, it's a shift and it's a movement that as you're building your company, you're pivoting, you're testing, yes. and there's a position where you have yeah. to make a decision: Can you double this business? Can you four times this business. If you can't, then how do you move into a direction where you can? Exactly. There's exactly there's so much value in humility here. If you go back to your investors and say, look, I, you know, I've taken your 10K check. I'm only able to give you the 5K check because I've spent of I've spent half of it to prove or disprove that what I was doing was right or wrong. I'm now I now know what I've learned. I, I know my lessons. I'm going to give you my, I'm, I'm going to liquidate the company. I'm going to give you what's left. You take it. 
Next time I come back, I'll tell you a bit more. I'll have, I've le I'll have learned and I have much more chance to succeed next time. So I'm, I'll be more inclined to raise money again because I know that I will have created trust with somebody. You know? I like that. No, that is, that is very valuable. If you could get entrepreneurs to think that way and go to that direction, hey, you know what? You've got the money there. If you're going to be able to make the right hypothesis and, and build it out into a business, and if you don't, figure out where you can make that change. And if you can't, then fail exactly. and start something new, but bring something back to the investors that show, hey, they paid your time to do this. Now move on to something else that may be more constructive. And you'll probably find that that investor that came in the first time will come in a second time because they're going to see that you were true to your end goal exactly. and stuck behind what you're doing. So I love that. That's uh, um I guess we can preach it and hopefully maybe some startups will see that as a, a way to test. They're getting paid to test a theory. And if that theory works, then they're going to be able to be successful and they have a great team of investors and uh, other people supporting them. So that's great. So on this journey, and I've read a bunch of different things that you've written and you composed around this. So maybe you can share a little bit more about how you envision and see a startup going through this process. Um, because you're kind of in a way you're trying to change the way VCs work and the way that they fund early stage companies. So how does that look to you? If I start a new company and I come to you, Kevin, and I say, Kevin, I got this great idea. This is what it is. How do you see the journey for me from raising funds? Yeah. So um, from, from your point of view, and I'd like to go back to uh, your point still about, um, you know, the way, we see VCs moving forward is that, um, you know, VCs are um, great on their own right. They do what they can with the model that is suited for purpose, right? Yep. So it's essentially just to do a quick parenthesis on this is that um, they invest a bit of their money they prove they can find good companies and show some and some some track record they set up a fund, they raise the fund, they deploy the fund, they liquidate the fund. That's pretty much 99.9% .9 of the VCs on earth, right? Um, but they are super small teams and um, we know that some of those ones, they see so much deal flow that they are struggling to see that deal flow and curate that deal flow properly and make sure they obviously do the proper due diligence because what's on the website and on the pitch deck is very often different from what's you know uh, on the code base or what's on the bank account or what's on the customer pipeline. Yeah, um, so there is a lot of due diligence and due diligence is super key here to be a good investor at seed. You need to put your emotions away. You need to tell, I don't like this entrepreneur. Even if you do, you need to, you need to be so controversial. You need to be like, I, you know, almost like bipolar. I like it, I don't like it. And always find reasons not to like a deal. And, uh, and then that is that is going to be a gift to you because you're going to be spending so much time into the details that will make this business um, kind of work or not. Yeah. So having said that, we think that all VCs are going to be forced to effectively spend more time with the companies that they enable, they 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 back. Right. Uh, if you look at the best VCs on the planet, you know, the A16Z and the Sequoias and the Benchmark, they all have teams working with their portfolio companies. They do not, they try to reduce the, uh, the uncertainty by being super hands-on. They are, they are large funds, they manage billions, you know, but they are super hands-on. They still have lots of people on their um, uh, payroll and those are some of the best and they work with the portfolio companies. They just don't deploy cash and come for, uh, you know, they go to the, come to the next board meeting asking you how, you how fast you are growing, right? That's very much well, what all VCs should do, but the reality is that the model is so, so limited. So you as an entrepreneur trying to raise money today, what's super important is that you define 
precisely what you're trying to achieve yourself, what you are trying to prove as a company, right? What it is, is it your first revenue? Is it that you're trying to get to a certain level of uh, product maturity? Is it because you are trying to find on some market research and some product developments to prove your business model? What it is, what, are, what, is, what is it that you are financing? Yeah, is it your product market fit? Is it, are you financing your minimum viable value? You know, how, what's the value that you're creating to a customer, which you can quantify and say, now I know my pricing, you know, what it is that you are financing. And truth is that money is not going to give you that, you know, money is just going to give you the fuel, but you still need to find the right, you know, the right direction. And obviously the, 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 the vehicle to get there. The vehicle being the team, being your operation, you know, being all of that. So, um, so um, yeah, I think you as an entrepreneur, the way we see this evolving is that we are a, a, a co-investment platform. We are we are working alongside um, other angel networks and and VCs, uh, and then we are offering this platform for them to review deals more effect more effe effe efficiently. Uh, for them to leverage their network and an external network better when it comes to doing startup due diligence. Typically, can you tell me what you think about this? Can you look at the cybersecurity side of this business? Can you tell me if this is going to scale? You know, can you tell me about the science? Is this GDPR compliant? You know, all of those things that are super important when you're making a deal, um, then you really want to make sure that you've got a, a good a good network around your deals when you are before investing in because they you can't see you can't know everything yourself you just cannot yeah you can be you can have great gut feeling and you can write a check and be super lucky but those are exceptions not the rule yeah so um so you know back to the story as an entrepreneur when you're raising money you're going to be working with one of our vc or angel network partner they're going to be um basically backing you, they're going to say, okay, well, you need four, you need 500K. We write a check of 300K, but we'll go invest with Concealance Ventures. They are bringing the network of expertise to get you to your next, to your objectives, right? To to get you achieve your goals. You know, we think that you're an amazing team, but you need a great CFO doing, um, you know, half a day a week. You need the right, um, COO, you need a, a, a regulatory uh, director, you need, uh, you know, one of the best lawyer, what that's what you need to start, you can't afford just to work with kids outside of, you know, coming out of, you know, universities, because they don't want to work for big corporates, that's not the right, that's not the right, you know, um, uh, channel to hire customers. It's great to have young kids, you know, cool kids, you know, 20, 30 years old, um, and uh, because they've got plenty of energy and stuff. But at the at the end of the day, what you want is you want to have people that can be accountable, responsible, and make proper decision, right? Um, so that's why, as a startup, the average the average age to succeed is 42 years old, right? It's, there's a reason for that. It's not. It's because you know, you've got the Zuckerberg and you've got some others that are super lucky, you know, get into things. And of course, they, they are, they've got great backing. So they, they get, you know, they, the, the market was with them. So, you know, all the stars were aligned. But the rule is that you need to have lots of industry experience if you want to win and you need to be surrounded by the right people. So, you know, to get the long story short, we go invest alongside angel investors and VCs, they bring the cash because that's what they do. We bring the expertise. And when I say we, it's sometimes them as well. The only thing they do is they're using our platform and our technology to invest to invest their time into a digital assets because we have created this currency for entrepreneurs um, by converting the shares of the companies into a tradable asset. So that's very much the scenario here. Now we offer speed at the back of this because not only you work with the right expert at the beginning, you know, we've got the former CEO of uh, Firefox, we're talking to uh, the former CEO of HP, we're talking to uh, uh, for we, one of our investors, the former CIO of Santander Bank. Those guys, they have 20, 30 years experience. They don't bother much working for 1,000 pound or 2,000 pound a day. That's not what gets them out of bed 
you know, what excites them is that they are building something super big that is going to turn lots of money in five, 10 years. That's what excites you. That's what motivates them. And also because they enjoy being, um, uh, you know, uh, involved in complex challenges as well. So all of this is nothing about money, as you can tell, which is where we come from. No, I like that. So in there, is there, is there a different journey than you're taking from a pre-seed to a seed to a series A? Uh, if we start with, with yourself, yeah. do, that, do you change the dynamics of this now because yeah, of it's, the type invest? It's a very good point, actually. You can, uh, you know, since we enable startups to um, convert their shares into a currency to have access to a curated network of experts, effectively what you can do as, the, as a result is that you can break down the uh, fundraising cycles into small chunks instead of going after big, big uh, rounds. So as an example, instead of starting, you know, a seed round at two or three million, you know, European, you know, average, um, you know, seed round size, you would, um, you would basically get going with 250k, you convert your shares, you can you convert 250k worth of your shares into this currency, you, you pay some experts, and some of your employees, some of your teammates, whoever, to get to the next sprint, right? what do you try to prove in the next six months? You raise that. In six months, you have proven X, Y, Z. Your valuation is higher. Your risk is lower. You raise again 250K, a much interesting, much, much more interesting valuation because you have there is the business. So all of a sudden, as an entrepreneur, I, I earn on the valuation because I don't get to spend my equities at the wrong valuation. Something that young entrepreneurs don't understand is how equity works. Mostly, most, most, most entrepreneurs we talk to, they don't have a clue about what the importance of good equity management, no clue. Um, and um, even some of the serious, even some of the more mature entrepreneurs, because this is this is an art on its own. Is under, understanding equity management is king for an entrepreneur. Um, so, in the end, entrepreneurs working with Concilience Ventures, they get they get a better deal than if they are raising the next eighteen months of cash flow, because it, when they you know when they raise eighteen months of cash flow, you know ten or 12 months later this round they are still pen, they are still spending their equities that they you know at the price at which they raised you know 12 months ago although the business is completely different because young startups are changing you know high growth companies are are different every 6 months you know every 6 months you are a different company so why do you need to raise 18 or 24 months of cash flow if you know that six, you know six months, six from six months from now, you're going to be a very different company, right? Why would you not be smart about this and just raise your next six months? And the reason why today it's not done, it's because it's bloody hard to raise money. It takes six nine months already. So when you do this for six nine months, you want to do it only for 24 months, 18 or 24 months, because that's only what makes sense. Because you don't want to keep you know, spend your time doing this. But if you really focus on building your business and you really get your product right and you really get your team right and your exec team right and then you go after a big market, then you should be raising as little as possible and then do it again very quickly. You know, and and and, you, and that's how we breaking we breaking this cycle down. You know, there's something emerging here. I mean, it's it's been around for a few years now, but there was no seed, you know, at the times of the Amazons or the, you know, there was no seeds. It was Series A right away. And then you had seed. And then now everybody's talking about pre-seed. And now, in, now everybody's talking about pre-seed, seed, pre-Series A. So as you can tell, the, the, uh, the, the you know, the fundraising cycle is shortening. Right? It's shortening. Um, and, and of course, then you, re, you know, you raise a series B and a series C, and then, then you take your 25 million in the bank and then you expand. So growth money, it's still roughly the same, you know, as is unchanged, but the whole launching and growth phase, you know, the early days of the growth of the companies is completely, you know, it's changing. And we want to do micro financing for companies, not 
pre-seed or seed, but just your project, get it, prove it, show us what you've done. And we do this alongside other VCs who are themselves writing money and of course writing checks and of course benefiting from the um, process of de-risking those businesses and investing at the right valuation for the right risk instead of just benchmarking. No, I love it. And, and I wholeheartedly agree with you that, you know, companies will come to me and say they're raising a million and a half dollars on a, a pre-money valuation and pre-revenue. And I'm like, well, why wouldn't you raise 500,000 and show what you can do and then come in and do another race and another race and just keep doing micro raises because yes. you're pivoting and changing. You don't, you're not, uh, I guess the best example is that um, you're going to climb a mountain. You don't start at the bottom of the mountain. Exactly. You start climbing. You start way further back. Exactly. And then there's 15 trails that will get you to the base of the mountain. Exactly. We're going to pick the right trail that gets you there. So keep doing the things you need to to get there. And then when you get to the base of the mountain, there's maybe two trails that will get you to the top. And you've got to really, at that time, you got to focus, hire them, make sure you got the right teams, the right money, the right everything to pick the right trail because the temperature changes, the weathers are different, and you're going to go through that growth. And I think you've got to get to there first. There, there, are, there are some benefits, you know, there are some nuances is what I'm saying, is that there are some benefits of raising big chunks, you know, of money. It's because it helps you to attract, you know, some talents that would not consider you otherwise. But I think this is very much where finance is changing, is that the best people are not looking for money anyway. They're looking for real skin in the game. Correct. Yeah. They won't, that's what the, you know, that's not what they are looking for. So of course, if you can say, look, you know, I've raised the, you know, 1.2 million, you know, um, I'm now ready to pay you a hundred K salary. Well, you know, you may be doing a mistake here because you, in, instead that person, if that person is the best person, that person may take half in equity and half in cash because you are much more, um, you know, resilience cash flow wise, that's what really matters here. So um, at the end of the day, if we, but at the end of the day, you don't want to have 20 employees on your cap table because it's a mess, right? You don't want to do this. So that's where you create a NISOP and stuff. Yep. But um, what if you really tokenize the shares of the vehicle and you use this as a currency without having them on your cap table? Bang, you know, problem solved. So all of a sudden you work with the, and you don't, sometimes those people are too good that they don't need to be full-time. Our CFO, for example, our CFO, former CFO of EasyJet, when, when I started the company, there was no, there was no way I was going to take, you know, EasyJet CFO full-time, you know, but the guy was so brilliant that he needed to do half a day a week or something. Mm. And that's how we started. And we did this for a year and then, you know, and, uh, I really, you know, he became, I was totally dependent on him because he is just, a, you know, an amazing CFO. And thanks to him, we managed to get, get on securing amazing um, uh, tax claim um, and an amazing R&D credit. And, you know, and, and we were very uh, wise in terms of money management, very wise. And it was only possible because the guys that's done that, you know, for, multi-billion dollar companies and he was also financing some spin spin outs of you know backed by EasyJet and, and Easy Group. So so that's what I'm talking about here is that you don't need to pay a full time salary if that person is the right person at the beginning. There is a point where you need to onboard those, but it's gradual. So that's why you don't and then since hiring it's gradual, why do you not raise money gradually? Yeah. So that's the very, that's very much the bottom of it. You have to raise money gradually as you onboard more resources. I love it, and, and it has to be synchronized. No, it's uh, I love the way you uh, the way you shared that. It, it totally makes sense. There's uh, um, there is a totally a different way to manage financing and the way you raise funds. And I think a lot of startups will get a lot of, a lot out of this conversation on learning how those different vehicles can work for them and how they can grow their team and part-time CFOs and part-time people can actually help them move, give them some shares, prove the business, and then slowly start to grow and build in those key areas of people that are gonna really make other angels and other VCs 
want to invest more. Much more interested. Up. Yeah. Much more interested. Because you are a safe business, and you know, uh, you, are sa- you are a much safer business. Yeah. Because you've got those people taking care of what really matters at this point. And then uh, you, you, you know, no matter how many co-founders you have to start with, there are always lacks, you know, uh, you know, shortcomings uh, in the team and, and then gaps, right? Always. Really? You know, I, I'm not going to mention any names, but um, when I was at Microsoft with my team, when we were doing the tech due diligence before onboarding companies, we were working with companies that were very well funded by VCs. They had no tech, absolutely no tech. And they were rising at tech, you know, at valuation of tech businesses with, uh, you know, a revenue multiple, you know, that would make no sense, right? And there was no tech. So how do those, how do those people with no technology you know, get to raise that those crazy valuations, um, money from people who are professional, because we're not talking about raising money from these, from angels, which are largely unprofessional. There are some professional angel investors now. There are some solo capitalists, but there are more uh, people that just do this as a side gig because it's fun, because it gives me, you know, it excites me, and then it's also a good placement because if I look at a bit of my money there, I'm much more likely to get, you know, some money back if I if I diversify well enough. And diversifying means at least having 50 companies in your portfolio. The problem with 50 companies in your portfolio is that you're going to be taking, it's going to take you a decade to get to 50 companies because you need to review at least 5,000 deals. And I'm not talking about investing in all of the companies that raise money for crowdfunding because we know the average returns of crowdfunding platform is very, very, it's, you know, it's close to nothing. So, uh, and that's why, you know, most crowdfunding platforms are not sustaining in the end is because the companies that are raising, you know, um, by crowdfunding are, you know, are not that great. Um, Some are, but uh, it's just very, it's a lot more difficult because there's a lot more noise. So yeah, at the end of the day, how do you build a a nice diversified portfolio alongside top players who know how to select companies and know how to take care of businesses and business growth? without spending your whole life on it. Just leveraging a nice network of people who know exactly what they are doing. And, uh, and by leveraging this network, uh, this what we call uh, wisdom of the crowd, then you obviously invest in something that is you know, by default a lot less risky. And therefore your revenue multiple may not be 30, 50 times as if you found the only unicorn because you only have 0.03% uh, or 0.02% to find a unicorn. You know, if if you don't find a unicorn, then if you find companies that exit at hundred million, then it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, it's still a good win. No, I love it. That's great. All right, so now we're going to shift quickly into our rapid fire questions. Right. Uh, I think you and I could talk about this for a very long time because uh, it's both dear to our uh, our our business models and how we work and how we invest. So I love it. Um, but we got to jump into these questions and then we got a couple of questions to end it all off with, but right. uh, so far, amazing. Okay. okay. Uh, what's your favorite part of investing? Um, well, that's a tough one. Um, it's uh, my favorite part of investing is um, understanding how uh, entrepreneurs think about the business they are after. That's really what excites me is that I'm learning so much the way, yeah, that's, so that's what it is. So think about the way in, invest, entrepreneurs are thinking. That's what I enjoy the most. I like it. Uh, how many companies do you invest in per year? We've, uh, we've made five investments this year. We're going to be doing about 20 next year. We're building our capacity to make 100 investment a year. Awesome. Uh, any verticals that you like to focus on? We for now focus on on fintech, uh, medtech, and also uh, we also have strong capabilities in IoT, industrial, um, cyber security. Okay, we have a couple companies you can check out. All right, uh, any due to. diligence requirements that you look for before you make a commitment? So uh, anything that really stands out that you got to make sure you mentioned team before, but. Uh, is there anything else on a paperwork side that you really want to make yeah. sure you have? Yeah, we have um, very uh, uh, disciplined uh, due diligence framework where we have about 30 data points 
um, per startup, but we also have broken that down into three different uh, company maturities. So we have 30 questions um, broken down into six uh, different categories that will go for, pot for prototype companies. Uh, and you have the same for product market fit companies, or at least companies that pretend or believe they have rich product market fit. And part of this ass assessment, it's also validate whether they have rich product market fit or whether they have, or they, whether they believe they've reached product market fit. And then there is another set, there's another set for, uh, for scale ups. So in the end, all of this is standardized uh, and it's basically based on the company maturity. Uh, yeah. Okay with some weighting and stuff, so yeah. Makes sense. Uh, do you lead rounds? We do both. Okay, uh, any preferred terms? Do you care if it's prep shares, common shares? Uh, we are we, we are flexible on we are we are we are a flexible investor. We um for we sometimes we will you know we'll take a board. Sometimes we won't. We're very much flexible. At, at the end of the day, not every deal is you know all deals are different. So um, we're just agile here. We do what makes sense. Okay, and do you have a follow-up investment on the companies as well at a percentage of that investment? So um, at this point, we're looking at continuing investing into all our companies uh, up to um, Series B and certainly beyond, um, de de depending on the appetite of our network. But given that we, uh, we reinvest uh, on a um, performance basis. So if they're reaching certain criteria, we are investing. Okay. Uh, any companies that stand out that you want to share? You don't have to share the names, but you're more than welcome. Any companies that you think are rock stars you really want to talk about? I think one rock star in our portfolio, emerging rock star in our portfolio is a company uh, called Checkstep, which is doing amazing work in tackling uh, um, issues around quality content, organic uh, user generated content online. So, I mean, all of our companies are super exciting. We've got company tackling private debt issues, working with uh, uh, debt uh, and insolvency uh, practitioners. So they are basically uh, doing amazing deep learning to enable the regregation of data and then the stru structuring uh, of data a lot more faster than anyone else in the market. We've got amazing AI for uh, premature baby. Um, and we've got some, uh, some cool tech that are just very good UX UI for wealth managers. And uh, yeah, so that's so the, we've got a pretty exciting portfolio. Awesome. Okay, so now we're going to jump into two more questions. And then we're gonna have a couple personal questions to end it all off. So okay. uh, I may have an internet issue at the personal question. You never know. <laughs> all right, actually, one more question. So based <laughs> on all the things that you've done, everything you've gone through throughout your career to get yourselves to the platform you guys have built and the way you're investing and the way you're helping startups. Is there any heartfelt story that you want to share that really defines what an entrepreneur is like someone that maybe went through a tough go and it succeeded or they went through a tough go and they decided that it wasn't working and they failed fast any great story that the community can relate to yeah that's a tough one um you know i think it's i think there's the common pattern is that if you um if you if you seeing that you're pushing too hard and you don't get any results, and I see this as a pattern across you know some of the entrepreneurs I admire, but there are a few ones that um, I prefer not to uh, mention. Yeah. They've gone through tough times, very very difficult times, yeah. and they and they exited um, in the range of fifty million dollars, and they consider this as being a failure because they were building something very very big. So yes, I've seen entrepreneurs suffering a lot, and then um, that kind of um, I was um, uh, yeah I was um, not emotionally um, affected, but it was very hard to see how painful uh, this process of raising money was, given the size of the opportunity they were going after, and given the size of the problem that they were solving. And that's one of the challenge, which is some, sometimes 
something that um, makes me really think hard about how we can change the way companies get funded is because real innovation, at least in Europe, rarely get funded. Very, very rarely. You, have, you don't have lots of risk takers in Europe. You have lots of LPs, mostly governments. So you have lots, lots of very conservative LPs. And as a result, really innovative companies not, don't raise money from European investors, which is why now these US VCs are doing their shopping here because there is a land of opportunities for risk takers because European, Europe is conservative in comparison to uh, the US, but the technology and the talents that is you know, growing up here is just amazing. And uh, it's just so frustrating not to see so much mo more money uh, coming into this market because um, if, you, if, you bring, if you bring that um, capital and expertise to this, this market, You've got something amazing. This is the best market in the world per capita, right? Europe is the best by far, you know, if, you know, before the US. Uh, so um, of course, there is less venture capital money flowing, um, but the um, standard um, of living here it's very high, so people can buy. That's interesting because I I, I would say that. Based on that theory and, and the information shared, Canada is very similar. Where, yeah, uh, you know they they're very risk adverse. Um, Americans tend to have uh, see it, go after it, and take it down and move to the next thing quickly. Yeah. So I think everybody carries their own value, but there's not very many countries that have the same uh, mindset financially. Uh, the American. Uh, the U.S. is very much driven around finance. Their whole country is. And, the whole country. Yeah, and that's what makes the U.S. the global power that they are. Exactly. Uh, the rest of the countries are a lot more reserved. And mm -hmm. even COVID has really pulled a lot of countries back even further because uh, even though they know 95% of the countries made up a small business, the risk factor is very reduced because that's what they teach you. Mm -hmm. uh, to save for rainy days and not to invest in things that seem crazy. But the ones that have been the most successful happen to be the ones that are a lot more innovative and more crazy. And uh, Completely. yeah, and you'll usually find that Americans don't have a problem jumping on that because the risk factor is there because they've been brought up on paying for themselves, taking care of themselves, that money's only as far as you can find it and build it and grow it and make it happen. Whereas the rest of the world is go get a job, work for this company and get your money and put it in a bank account and save exactly. up. So it's a tough space to be maneuvering in, but I think you're right that there's a lot of... Uh, opportunity to pick up some great and great companies to invest in if you're open to it and you can handle the risk. Exactly. Exactly. So the personal side questions, which is always my favorite, uh, only <laughs> because it's only something I recently started doing a couple of, maybe a month ago. So uh, the best way, the, the first question is, what is your first sp favorite sports team? Uh, sports team, it would be, um, you know, it would be right now, right now it's Mercedes, um, you know, McLaren, um, you know, um, Hamilton without any doubt. Which team was that? Mercedes McLaren. So, uh, Formula One, uh, yes. champion, you know, Grand Prix. Hamilton is by far. Hamilton, yeah. I was just like, really? All right. I like that. Yeah, that's good. Yes. My my favorite sports team right now. They've managed to crack everything. Yeah, I like it. That's brilliant. Okay. Um, what is your favorite movie and which character would you play in the movie? <laughs> uh, that's a funny one. <laughs> what's my favorite movie? I don't know what's my favorite movie. Uh, uh, I think... Um, um, yeah, I know, I know. Um, I don't know the uh, the name in um, in English. Let me just look it up for you. I just want to make sure I can share with the audience Intouchable. Oh, yes, actually, it's actually so the uh, Intouchables. Yeah, uh, okay. Intouchables. Yeah, and uh, so and I would play um, I would play the uh, the main character, which is the funny guy along, you know, working for the. Uh, a disabled man, you know, doing some crazy stuff, uh, making people laugh. 
uh, and given you know given uh, you know Omar C, uh, so so Omar C, the, uh, the the main uh, the main um, actor, you know doing some crazy stuff, making everybody love and go outside of their comfort zone to the point that it actually is enjoyable. So That's, Untouchables is the is the I want to make sure I got the right movie here. Yeah, the the Untouchables. Yeah, the Untouchables, which is from nineteen eighty seven. Uh, Al September 20, 2020, uh, 20, uh, 12. Oh, 2012. So I got the wrong one here. Okay. So I'm not finding the right movie here. What's the... yeah, there you go. Um, drop it here, the untouchables. Uh, and uh, I even share you with you the trailer because if you didn't see it, then uh, it's a must, uh, it's a must watch. All right, and you're gonna play the uh, oh, Intouchables. Oh, I remember this movie. I saw this. Yeah. Yeah, this movie was fantastic. It's amazing movie. Yeah. It, 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 it's it's everything in one movie. You've got nice cars, you've got good laughters, yeah. you've got somebody who's was was super wealthy and 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 fortunately very very bored because of his uh, uh, because uh, his. Um, um you know his health yep. and um and in the end he has so much fun with without even thinking of the money because just somebody super poor is giving that person so much good time yeah no i so, thought it was a brilliant movie yeah it came it's up an amazing so amazing so you would play you'd play uh drift yeah exactly yeah omar Sai, right yeah, yeah. He had a good character he was and he Fantastic actor too. I really like that. Yeah, he's a very good guy. Well, that's brilliant. All right. Well, so Kevin, I want to thank you very much for your time today. Um, as I always do, I took lots of notes. Uh, <laughs> big fan. So thank you very much for that. We're going to see you at Skip the Line on on December first at two p.m. Eastern. That's so right. We're excited to now to have you join us there. Yeah, and, you uh, to book me up. And what I, what I like to leave the, the end of the show with is I like to leave you the last word. So anything you want to share to entrepreneurs or to investors, uh, the floor is yours. Feel free to uh, share. Yeah. With you. yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I guess the last, uh, the last words, uh, two words is uh, have fun. Just have fun. This is so hard to make it more complex than what it is you are dealing with human. It's completely irrational. So make sure that you have fun all the time. Find this somewhere what, to have fun in this process, right? This is what this is what matters in the end. And do work only with people that you have fun with. If you don't feel comfortable with the people in the room, you should not take their money. And uh, yeah, that's what that's the most important bit here. I love it. Well, great last yes, words, Kevin. Thank you very much again. Uh, fantastic. Uh, lots there to learn, lots to, to regurgitate and take in. But I love the idea about microfinancing, man. It's uh, it's a different way of looking at things, and it can allow companies to move and pivot quicker and get into the right space. So I appreciate your time again. Thank you. We'll see you December 1st. And sure. uh, we have a couple of companies I'm going to share with you as well. Uh, but you can find them all on supportersfund.com. But there's an IoT company there. There's a fintech company there. And I think there might be some opportunities for you guys to... Uh, yeah chat and work together i'll take a look thanks jeff it's been fun you bet you take care mate have a great day you too cheers Thanks. well that was awesome i'm a big fan of kevin and what those guys are doing i love their platform i love the idea of restructuring the finance doing it in, in micros i talked about the onion peeling back the layers there's lots of different layers where people are going to get involved fail fast and win. I think that's the, a great way of looking at things. So uh, overall, I think it uh, was great to see and uh, very excited that uh, we got to chat and we're going to see him on uh, December 1st on the panel. All right. See you guys.